Hey everyone. Welcome to the ATX Television Festival, day three. Having a good time so far? Awesome. So this is our creating and casting panel today. We've got some great panelists for you. Um, just a quick note, no flash photography, no recording. We're recording it for you, so you don't need to do that. Give the panelists all of your attention and be respectful to your fellow audience members. Uh, so without further ado, this is our moderator, Ben Travers from IndieWire. Uh, thank you so much. I am Ben Travers, the TV critic at IndieWire. Uh, I'm very excited to be here. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. Um, who's ready to talk about some casting, right? <laughs> all right. Good industry people. This is exciting. Um, all right, so let's bring out our lovely guests. We've got quite the crew for you, starting with uh, two lovely ladies from the upcoming Netflix series Glow, Jennifer Houston and Liz Flayhive. Teamwork already in effect. Uh, next up, we've got uh, two lovely ladies from Grace and Frankie, Tracy Lillian Field and Marta Kaufman. <laughs> and then to round out the group, uh, kind of a trio from Sons of Anarchy as well as an old show called Enlisted, Wendy O'Brien, Mike Royce, and Paris Barclay. I think we've got everybody settled in, and I'm going to start with, with I hope, what's a fairly easy question, fairly fun question. Here's another mic if somebody needs one. Um, you guys have uh, a very close relationship, obviously, through, through work and through business, so what I'm curious about is kind of how that all started. So if you guys could just kind of go down and, and note the first project you worked on, and then also the first project, or how you, how you met. For the, either for that project or elsewhere, and, and kind of how this relationship started. Well, ours is brand new. <laughs> We're like in the honeymoon stage. Um, uh, Awal Genji was executive producing Glow, and I thankfully cast Genji's stuff, and they just, she put me forward, and Liz and Carly and I really got along, and so we did it. And <laughs> so that was, I guess, it, right? It was sort of a new relationship, yeah. but built on old relationships because yeah. you'd worked with Genji and you'd worked with Jesse Peretz, our oh, director. Yeah. Okay. So we had some sort of like old relationships and, holding and Carly up the new relationship. Carly worked on Orange, right? So yeah. it was a Carly, her, her, her partner worked on Orange. So yeah, it was all just like we know we're all, we would like each other. So, and then we did. So it was great. <laughs> and now we're never letting her go. Uh, Marta, yeah. We have a very different story. Um, we met at nursery school. <laughs> our, we have our oldest children were in literally, literally in a preschool together. I'm um, in a nursery school together, and that's how we first met. And we had friends in common, though, who kind of yeah. told us about each other. But we became friendly right around the same time we started working together on Dream, Dream On in 1980. 26 or 27. 27 years ago. Um, and that was our first chance to work together. And then we actually, for none of our reasons, had all kinds of difficulty trying to get to work together again because it was such, because we know each other um, and we've had the opportunity to work together and you develop a shorthand, we kept wanting to do it. And then, you know, this person can't because they can't, and this person can't. Now you're at this studio, and they don't hire people from the after me, 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 me. And then, you know, so you got to go to Netflix so that you can work with who you want to work with. And uh, it, it's true. Back um, in the day when Marta was at Warner Brothers, everything was done in house, which is so so different than it is now. We're all independent. They have casting departments that oversee us. But in those days, Warner Brothers had their own in house casting, so I didn't work there. I couldn't do a little show Marta did. <laughs> Mm. All right, so we've got newlyweds. So obviously I'm not Kurt Sutter. I'll get that out of the way. <laughs> and I won't curse. 
unless I have to. Ah, uh, come on. Uh, but I do know Kurt Sutter. I met Kurt Sutter. <laughs> Uh, and I've definitely met Wendy O'Brien. When I did the very first episode of Sons of Anarchy was the first time that I worked with her, which was in season one. It was one of the first episodes of the show. And from that point through 92 episodes, she's cast every episode. And so there have been times when we've worked together and we've had 10 characters that are going to recur in a single episode. And this is the person that we went to. And since we believe in actually having live, in-person casting, where humans actually come in and perform and you talk to them, it's, it's old now, but because people don't want to do it, Wendy always did that for us. She always brought the actors into our offices. She always commented on them. And uh, she was virtually almost always right. <laughs> so that's why, I, I, for me, it's been the best casting experience that I've had. You guys do work well together. <laughs> it's the chemistry. I'll just say, I, we started working together on uh, Men of a Certain Age, uh, and which then we got canceled so that we could work together on Enlisted, which we also got canceled. <laughs> but I echo everything that Paris said about Wendy. Uh, she is amazing. Now talk about yourself, how you're amazing. All right, well, I'm, I'm definitely going to get you to talk on this one because I have no idea how you casting directors get started. Like, how do you get started in this business, in this profession? It seems like such a daunting task because you're being asked to know a, so much, like have so much knowledge, know so many people, and dig right in to, to do all this work for these lovely people who need you right off the gun. So I'm sorry, uh, how, did you, how did you start? Who wants to, do you want to, you want me to Point start? Okay. Um, <laughs> it's a lot. No, I'll try to make it as short as possible. Um, I always wanted to work on film and television since I was about seven or eight, and I knew it then. And I, I back behind the scenes. I, like, I don't, this is why my eyes close when I talk when I'm on stage, because I hate being in front of people. So, But I've gotten a little better at it. Um, so anyway, stage fright. So uh, I just studied film all through high school and stuff. And then as soon as I knew I could go to co college and study film, I did. I took cinema studies at NYU. And while I was there, I did internships in radio, film, television, in production offices, on set. So I see if I wanted to be a script coordinator, editor. And then I was working on a movie uh, right before my junior year and I, I discovered casting, which I never knew it even existed. That was like in the, in the mid 90s. And there's much more awareness now, I think, there, than anything else. And uh, yeah, so I fell into it then. And then I, I just, I've been doing it ever since. So since I'm, I'm 42 now, so like 23 years since I was like 19. And I've, it's all I've ever done. I love actors and I love film. And I mostly worked on film until about, until, until girls came along because that just, everything just started changing around that and uh, TV became such like the medium. And TV and film are really different to cast. Um, so I had, to, I had to learn it and yeah, I guess that's about it, yeah. That, that's no, man. that's great. That's all I got, so yeah. <laughs> that's, that's great, that's a great story. Uh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, huh. um, so I, I was an actress like for a minute, but I knew that wasn't good. Uh, I started working for a theater, and I was the stage manager, and I didn't want to put tape on the floor anymore. I didn't even really know there was such a thing as casting, and there weren't very many independent casting directors at the time. Um, and then I went and worked in an agent's office in New York, and that was spectacular, and I was getting like closer, but I didn't exactly think it was perfect and then one of those agents left to cast a soap opera and he said you want to come with me and be my assistant I was like sure didn't even know what that meant uh, but I went and it was great and the minute I got there I said casting is for me thanks Perry you can imagine how it went yes. <laughs> um, uh, no, I so I started in college I uh, I was in college to row, that's all I thought about, and then I was about to graduate, I got cut from the national team, and I uh, was trying to figure out what I was gonna do in the last month of school with my life, and I got an internship. I loved movies, I loved English, I loved drama, and so I ended up getting an internship on a show, I was at school at University of Washington, um, on Northern Exposure which I think just had a reunion panel here. And so I was an intern on that, and it was awesome. And it was back in the day where you would cast off of, out of binders of photos. The agents would give you binders, and you'd pull out the photo. And, um, and then I moved to Vancouver, 
because I'm originally from Canada, and got on the first three seasons of X-Files. As an assistant associate, worked my way up, uh, and then moved to California like five years after that. That's great. And I mean, you all kind of you all kind of mentioned, or at least two of you kind of mentioned how you didn't re you weren't really aware of casting as as a project or as a as a profession. Um, and I do feel like it, it it is a little bit more prominent now. I feel like people understand the job exists and that it is very crucial and important. Um, do you guys, from your experience, was there a turning point? Was there a moment, or was there something that happened which brought awareness to it? Or how did people kind of finally figure out how important you were? I would like to acknowledge the Casting yeah. Society of America, <laughs> who we are very grateful to for sponsoring us here today. Um, and I think that was probably was, a, a big... It was, yeah, it was a big... Because we really... Casting... CSA had been around for a while, but it was really more of an association, you know, and... and but it, what, they're the ones who really got us unionized in 2005, right? 2006? Well... You kind of started forever. there. Yeah. It kind of started there, but it was not yeah. a CSA thing. Right, but I think us, I think us unionizing was the real like when everybody kind of came together and there, it wasn't about like you know competition or anything. Yeah, we just that wanted was to a have huge, huge change because yeah. we never we didn't speak to each other about things. We didn't share information, salaries, jobs, you know what was going on. Um, and when we started to unionize, which was eleven years ago, we realized we had to, and people did it reluctantly. But it turned out to be spectacularly yeah. good. Yeah, for and us. it was different in LA and New York. Like we were a really close yes, community in yes, New York. Yes. I always we told everybody everything. So it was just nice when LA kind of came around and <laughs> we could do. Well, it's true. It's a more. It's more. I mean, New York's it's a smaller bigger. community. Yeah. yeah, it's more competitive in LA and and it's different. And I, you know, I came up just with one. You know, it's, a, it's an apprenticeship. So you come up with a, another casting director that teaches you everything, and you know their friends who are other casting directors. So you know you could talk to each other. But yeah, I think we. You know, we didn't get benefits. We weren't. You know, I didn't even know what a four. I still don't know what a four hundred one k is. But <laughs> it's like. I mean, there's. There was just like you, you did it because you loved it, and that's. If anybody who stayed in it, it's because they loved the job as a vocation. I think it's like a calling, um, because there was no other incentive to do it. You know, graduating from school and getting five hundred dollars a week in my family. My parents were like, "What are you doing? You have no health insurance. What does that even mean?" So I, uh, I still think um, cast casting directors are underappreciated. Um, I would say, particularly, and this is going to feel ironic, by actors. I think they're underappreciated by actors. I think actors, um, sorry if there are any actors in here who I'm about to say something <laughs> about. Um, I think actor, actors believe they did it all on their own. And they don't realize that they have someone fighting for them, bringing them in, mentioning names that you might never, ever, ever had thought of. I, 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 yes, it's better, but I still think we have further to go um, for it to be truly understood that the full collaboration that makes the TV show work includes the not only the pilot casting but the casting every single week for your show and that that's part of what makes it what it is. It's part of what defines the identity of your show. Very well said. And kind of from a creator standpoint, that leads us into what are you guys looking for when you're hiring a casting director? Yeah. I mean, what are the what are the, <laughs> the traits, the qualities? You know, please by all means. I can I can answer that. I mean, I think the number one thing is you want someone who really cares about acting and likes to see people who are good. And then number two is they want those people to succeed. Really, I guess I'm looking for generosity and insight from a casting director. It's not just about shuffling the pictures and bringing people in. It's about somebody who really cares. One of the things about Wendy is she nurtures and tracks certain actors through different stuff. And when they come in, she says, oh, I saw them on this, or oh, we cast them last year in this, and they did really well. She's an advocate for people. And when I talk to directors and I tell them, if you can get a casting director who is half a director, you're going to have twice the easier time because they are already thinking about not only the end result, but who are the people that are gonna make a company? Who are the people who are not going to fuck you up, as we like to say? Oh, see, I cursed. Uh, who are the people who are gonna add to it? And a lot of the people that Wendy cast in Sons for small parts, one or two lines, 
you know, they end up being major characters by the end of the show. And we could do that because when we originally brought them in, when we originally cast them, they were really actors. Yeah. And that's because someone and her staff and her sort of had screened them or seen them in a play or done all that work that we just don't have time to do. So when they land in, uh, you know, in our little room, our little hot room in the valley, you know, half the work is done. And then when we cast them, you know, it's so much easier for me and for the other directors to direct them because we have real people that have sort of been pre-approved by Wendy and her team. And that's huge. And, and I agree with Marta 100%. It's underappreciated, especially, I think, by directors, too. I think they also think they did it all. <laughs> they think every choice is their choice. But you know, as I've told Wendy, and I'm sure she'll say this at some point, you know, I said, don't bring me more than five people for a role because after five, I start getting glazy. And then it's like, I need some chocolate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but then the five people will be great, and I can cast three of them because of her taste. So that's what we depend I, on. I think I I'm wholeheartedly agree with everything Paris said. I'd like to add to that. Um, it's not just taste. It's that the casting director understands the vision of the show, which is also your taste. So Tracy might bring an actor to someone else who she wholeheartedly believes in but knows isn't right. I mean, th there'll be a name that come up and Trace will just say, you won't like her. <laughs> just, she knows me. She just knows me, she knows my taste. This is not gonna be the right actor for you. And part of what I appreciate in a working relationship with the casting director is that there's a shorthand. So we don't have to spend hours and hours and hours describing. I mean, Tracy and I, when we're at our most efficient, we get on the phone for five minutes, and she goes, I got it, I got it. Um, and that's a great relief to know that someone gets me, someone gets my show. I know that what, and then the best part is that I can turn to Tracy and say, what do you think? And I can get from her an opinion that I believe. I know her, we've had a working relationship, I know her taste as well, and the ability to be able to turn to someone else, especially for the showrunner, and say, what do you think, who do you like, and know that you're gonna get an answer that comes from a place of believing in the actor and believing in the show and knowing what we do, is it takes so much off your shoulders. But Thanks, Tracy, I, thanks, yeah, Tracy. But, and, and here I will say about Marta, not every showrunner is good at casting. Um, and not every writer understands how to watch an actor and understands that in our little hot room, it is, you're at audition level, not performance level. And you don't need to see every moment perfect. And you don't need to make every single choice you're gonna end up. It is unrehearsed and undirected, it's an audition. But Marta just gets actors and understands actors and has through experience and whatever it is innately, knows what she's watching and where it can go, and that is such a huge relief and makes it so much better for me and better for everybody who comes in the room. And what gets fun about that is, like what you were talking about, we hired a guy for the pilot who now four years later, he had a tiny scene, but he stuck with us for all these years and he's coming back. Excited. I'm excited too. Um, there's, you knew, you know that that you, the casting is going well when you keep wanting these people to return and be part of the world that you're going to be living in day after day. Yeah, for sure. I was just uh, you, the 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 knowing how to watch an audition is so because I'm not. I don't get actors. I don't know what their problem is. <laughs> I, <laughs> prefer to never interact. No, that's not true. I mean, it's true. No, it's not true. Um, but, but, you know, I mean, right now I'm working on a, a, a traditional multi-camera sitcom, and if people come in and audition at that level that you need for the stage, you look insane. Because, you, you know, you have to be a little bigger and, you know, it's a theatrical experience. So to sort of have someone who walks you through, okay, you know, they can do this and I know this about them and maybe that, you know, also sometimes they had a bad audition and, the, you know, the casting director knows, no, you want to see them again, just give them one more chance or whatever. Um, because, yes, I can speak as a showrunner who sometimes I just react like, oh, that's not, you know, no, and they can, <laughs> Wendy can calm you down. And <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but I happen to love casting. And one of the things I love about casting 
is I love resumes. And I love reading special skills. <laughs> Come on, you get some great stuff in there. Yeah, it's oh, yeah. amazing, oh, yeah. banjo playing, tap dancing, equestrians who also ride unicycles. I mean, it's amazing. And, but what's great about it is you can read them. There's always something interesting in it. And it can always put an actor at ease because you say, do you really ride a unicycle? What's that like? And they can talk for a moment, then you go into the audition, and everybody's now a human being. Um, I think Tracy brings a lot of that also. You want not only an advocate, but someone who puts the actor at ease. And Paris, the other thing you said that I, I think is so important, actors don't realize we want them to succeed. We want them to do well. We don't want to be sitting in casting for four days. We want the first person to walk in to be perfect. We'll watch them all. Um, we want them to succeed. I think Tracy is a genuinely um, uh, supportive and energetic, enthusiastic casting director. And I think actors feel that, and they always seem very happy to see her. Yeah, that was something that struck me when we were casting with you. You know, just what? what? Um, <laughs> no, just like, I mean, also, you know, Genji has been, these guys have been making brilliant things for a long time, and this was our first show where we were actually casting series regulars and going through, and it's very stressful. It's stressful for, it was stressful for us to make that decision, to make that commitment, and so, and then it's stressful for the actor to come in and be in front of everybody. So you were sort of the calming force for all of us. Like, the actors would be, you know, you'd bring them in to, you'd go get them, bring them in, they'd take that walk with you and they would be calmer when they landed in the room. And then after the auditions, we'd call Jen and we're like, what do you think about this? Can you tell us what actually happened? Like, what do you, who do you think was great? And like, are we seeing the right thing? So I feel like you were just a therapist basically for months and which is a big part of it too. Cause I feel like I would wake up in the middle of the night and have one thought and then the next morning feel something different and you know you're just trying to locate what you actually feel about what I'm you're so, seeing yeah. and it's and I'm it's so like opinionated and, dis <laughs> and decisive which is really I mean that's part of our job we yeah. have to judge people all, every day and so I know we're gonna get what you need like I always knew because for glow we had a lot of interesting specifications that we had to fulfill yeah. it wasn't just a regular show it was like a physical show and and all different shapes and sizes and women and it was you know 14 women and one man that I had to put together in the 80s, you know? So yeah. so it was really specific. And But the great thing with you guys is, I mean, thankfully, they they trusted me, too. And, and like, Genji knows, too. Like, I just don't, you know, I don't, I'm a loud mouth. I'm just going to tell you exactly what I think. <laughs> and um, and it's great when it works out. You know, like, that's the best part. And, and, you know, to go on what they were saying about not seeing a lot of people, I mean, we cast a few of our girls just without seeing anybody else. Because I just knew. Like, I was just like, this is going to be it. Yeah, it you was know? like a combination of seeing people again and again and again. Right. Plus, and then, and then other roles where it was just like, this is the only this person. Is I, should, I should have one person. Yeah. But so. th things have changed a little bit. I'm listening to, you, to what we've all been saying. You know, there was a time when you did a pilot and had all this space before you were in production. But when you work for Netflix and for certainly some other places as well, you don't get to do a pilot. You're going straight to 13. So the casting becomes so important because you're not going to be making any changes. You don't have a learning curve. Um, so I think we are even more dependent on our casting director, especially because a lot of these shows don't have huge budgets. They have to cleverly find people who are willing to do it for the money. Um, so I think it's become in some ways trickier than it used to be when you had a little bit of room and you could go to the table read and go, oh God, we've got to fire that person. <laughs> you, can't, you can't do that now. Yeah, no recasting, sorry. Well, to kind of go along with that, I mean, it, one of the things I'm very curious about is in this relationship, what happens when you guys disagree? What happens when you, like one of you is a very strong advocate for somebody and the other person just can't see it, especially considering, like you said, both of you are so deeply invested in an understanding of, of what the other person wants as well as what's good for the show. So what do you do when you disagree? Ultimately, it's the showrunner's decision. I, I mean, say, Marta wins. It's, yeah, and, 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 and whoever I'm working for wins, if it's, you know, Genji, Lena, Liz, and Carly, it's like, they get, they should have what they want. I'm there to fulfill their vision, you know? So, and hopefully it's the same, but there are definitely times when we thought differently, but then 
ultimately you understand the other, you listen to the, it's list about listening. It's about listening to the, what the other side is looking for, why you think it should be this. And, and about just like staying open too. I yeah, think it's yeah. like until you find it, you're really, you're still open until yeah. like this is the person. Yeah. But in TV, in, it together. in TV, like in film, you know, the, the director is the last word. In television, it's the showrunner. So, you know. That's why we do it. <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I'm sitting here racking my brain to think if Tracy and I ever had like a real disagreement. I mean, there have been times where she'd say, oh, I'm surprised you picked that one. But I think that's the most disagreements we've had about things. I mean, there are people that I like that Marta says no to, and I pretty much just leave that alone. She, I completely trust her. And she has, she's deeper in her head about what she's looking for than, I'm pretty deep in her head, but she's deeper. <laughs> and that, yeah, no, and, and that's, no, you never, fought, just five, I said five. Oh. <laughs> there was one that was a wild card. Uh, but I think that's fun too when you're, especially like oscillating between comedy and drama and you, you, you'll intersect somebody who can do both or you know you're gonna put them in your pocket because you know this is somebody that Curdle love or parasol love or that's a my like you kind of know it's exciting and it keeps it exciting for us I think that you have different opportunities to show different actors to different showrunners and and you don't get bored either because you're not going to see all the same people and you you sort of know different tastes and where to head people in different directions and that's really fun that keeps everything alive and fresh and you're always meeting new people it, it keeps it it keeps it really interesting. I also think the show starts to tell you. Yeah. You know, the, you, you think you know, and then the show begins to take on its own identity and things work or they don't. You don't always know why, but it starts to tell you what's going to be right for a particular scene or a particular storyline or a particular arc. And I have to say one of, Tracy knows this very well, but one of my rules I have is, I have the life's too short rule. I don't care how good an actor is, if that actor is going to make me miserable, it's not gonna happen. I don't care how good that actor is. And that's just an absolute rule that Tracy knows about. Um, and I don't know if any of those people are on that list. That <laughs> yeah. but, but that's just one of those things that, that it doesn't have to be unpleasant. So that is something my yeah, casting director that. is I, well aware of. We have that rule. <laughs> <For sure. laughs> oh my God, with everybody. I mean, I'll just tell them. It's, yeah, I say, I don't, some people that I know that are terrible, if they ask me about it, I'll just I'll say why they're terrible and you don't want to do it old. Like maybe you do a movie with them for three months, but you wouldn't stay on a whole series with them because they would like destroy you. Yeah. Um, it makes, it no. just makes my palms sweat thinking okay. about it. No, you should, like we said a few names and you just shut them down immediately no. and we're like, okay. Not that person. Yeah, we we've tried. We got to get together thing. afterwards and share those names. <laughs> yeah, there's there's a really long list. It's the post panel but, panel. One of the things Mars said, I, we have the same rule, but it's harder to enforce nowadays, and in some ways easier because usually Wendy will tell us a little ahead of time if there's an issue, as we call it. This actor <laughs> has had an issue, or a show that I did, there was an issue, and we know that's sort of code word for. Watch the fuck out, this person's gonna ruin your life. <laughs> but also, just having live auditions, you can kind of tell within a few seconds when someone comes in a room Absolutely. what their attitude is and how they respond. And that's one of the reasons why I wanna see them, because I wanna give them some direction. A lot of times it's wrong direction. And I wanna I give them deliberately wrong direction for the scene, and I wanna see what they do. And some actors, like Mark Paul Gosselier that I just did pitch with, he'll just do whatever the wrong direction is that you give him. He'll just try it. He'll say, let me try that. He'll do it. That's the actor that I want. And it doesn't come out great, the scene, but some people argue with me, like right in the audition. They'll start saying, you know, I didn't see the character that way. And I'll go, oh, you just lost a job. Bye-bye. <laughs> well, how, how about the people who come in, they're coming in to audition for a de pizza delivery person, and they say, what's my motivation? <laughs> exactly. Get a tip. That's your motivation. Also, if there are any actors in the room and you are coming in for pizza delivery or doctor or whatever, don't wear scrubs. Don't come in costume. <laughs> That's really a bad idea. I know people really do that. They do that a lot. If, for a the lot. small parts, they really want the job, and so they've got their scrubs, or they've got their police outfit. Pizza box. <laughs> they've got their pizza box. Hi, this, my phone is going to be the pizza box. Don't do that. <laughs> We, it really, it makes us laugh, and not in a good way. And it's not really that helpful. We know we're gonna give you a pizza box. When you are the pizza boy, you will be given a pizza box. But we're, we're now trying to figure out if you can say a goddamn line. 
and not cause a lot of time. We also have a, another shorthand. I don't know if you guys have these shorthands. We, um, there are people who are enemies of comedy. There are people who are not pers per close personal friends of comedy. And there are people who are like this with comedy. So, you know, somebody will be brought up and Tracy will just say it's enemy. <laughs> enemy. I, I That's say, all you need I to say, know. They're not without humor. But <laughs> say, like, say it like that and then you know it's not. <laughs> It's, you know, something that's really, I mean, because getting someone to read is a whole art form. Oh, okay. And these people, like, we're the ones who get to say, that guy's got to fucking read. And then they have to go, hey, uh, I know how you said you didn't want to, you know, and they've got to make it happen. And it's, it's, I mean, everything that everyone's talked about is you're getting to see the proof in the pudding. And, I mean, Wendy, you know, when we did Men of a Certain Age, Andre Brower had to read. Wow. Yes, that's the right noise to make yeah. when I say that. <laughs> because... The truth is, it was a dramedy, and we had written it with a comedic, I mean, there was a comedic sense amongst the three guys, and we looked at Andre, Andre Brower wins, you know, he comes, his name comes on the Emmy ballot, right? Uh, we, but still, we scoured the internet, and up until that point, remember, this is before Brooklyn Nine-Nine or anything, up until that point, there is, I guarantee you, no recorded evidence that Andre Brower has ever been funny, ever. <laughs> we looked for everything, because he was in that movie, duets, I believe, and he's with uh, Paul Giamatti, and we're like, oh, here we go, this will be, and it's all him being a straight man to Paul Giamatti, and it, we couldn't find anything, and Andre, you know, gracious and wonderful human being that he was, came in and read for that part, but I mean, you know, it's, you have to see it, and, uh, and can we just establish that meetings are a waste of time, meeting, okay, you know, the meeting where you meet with a person and they don't read, okay, that's a, that's a bullshit thing. No, um, I think we we know we avoided that on on Glow because yeah. it's just stupid. It's like it's like yeah, you might meet them. They're nice and they're cool, but can they can they do what we need them to do? You know, but, but actors, some way it is. Sometimes it's a way to manipulate them into coming back to read. Sometimes, but then sometimes they're usually like they met the with them. So that's and sometimes it. you have Martin Sheen and Sam Waterston yeah. who, no matter what's going to happen, they're never going to read. Never. Yeah. And whether you've seen Sam do comedy or not, you've got to. Have meet, yeah. <laughs> have the conversation and see what, who is this person? And then say to your casting director, what do you think? <laughs> um, so yeah, on ours though, we, we all wanted all unknowns really. I mean, that was the, yeah, that was a big, yeah. that's big like part my, of it. that's my thing. I don't know if you guys know or not, but <laughs> Jen, Jen will find you people you've never seen before and, you, and, really, and um, you really haven't seen them. And I love doing yeah. that, you know? And so, so this, our show has no famous people in it. Yeah. I mean, just like one or two, Mark Maron, Mark, maybe yeah, like, cause you might know him and like Alison yeah. Brie, but yeah. that's, that's it. And that was even a little too. A little too fancy for me, actually. So yeah. no, and we had, and you know, that was one of those with Ali in yeah. particular. She and she'll talk. We talk about it all the time yeah. because it's now it's hilarious. Yeah. But we made her come in right. so many she, times. She wanted it so bad, and I and I known Allison for years, and I knew how bad she wanted it. So first she came in with me, and I was like, "Sorry, you got to do this, whatever, and I'll tape you." Then she, you know they, they liked her a little more, and then I was like, "Okay, now you got to come in for the director and the producers." And she doesn't read on things; she's like one of those people that's offer only, whatever. But I told them I was like, "She wants this so bad, it's gonna show. Like you're gonna see what she's gonna bring, and it's gonna be and amazing." It was, yeah, and know? it was like in the fight for the part. Yes, we saw it. Like exactly. we saw what we needed to see from her as an actor in terms of just how how she was going after it, how consistent she was, just how... And, that's how and in the show, that's out. Ruth, and I was just yeah. like, it's this right is, here. Yeah. Like, it's literally right here, because she's an actress in the show, too. Yeah. Like, it's not getting parts, you know? So it sort of uh, was parallel, but yeah. Yeah, no, I don't... They, I, you know, uh, it always upsets me when bigger actors do, you know, the network, net, the, net, the network or the studio like demands a reading. It's hard for us, I think, to even make those calls because it's embarrassing, you know, to call up and be like, yeah, so uh, Andre Breyer has to read, uh, you know, and you usually have to soften the agent a little bit, like, okay, so this might sound ridiculous, but hear me out. And it's, it's sometimes, scary sometimes. I don't want to make those calls. It is, it's awful, but also sometimes <laughs> those agents protect their clients right out of jobs. You yeah, know, trying to yeah, the agents them out of a job, the yeah. Thing, the offer only thing. Yeah. Well, Which is a false construct anyway. Yeah. Thank you. 
I want to talk a little bit about the, the unknowns and kind of how you guys are out searching for talent. I mean, is it is it literally just watching everything that you can? Is it going to everything that you can? What's the process like for you guys when uh, you're actively out searching for talent? We want to come Monday? They or? come to me, but... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I, you know, I, I usually work on a couple of projects and at a time, so sometimes we'll have you know, 60 people in the office every day. So... I mean, we're always, and nobody shows up for sessions generally anymore. Like most of the projects we do, nobody comes to the auditions. Um, you on producers. You producers, actors? producers or, or directors, okay. sorry, producers or directors. So, it, so we have the luxury of pre-reading while we're putting people on tape. We always get to bring in people we don't know as well because there's no one there. You, you can take more risks. This is the double-edged sword of where I am right now because we have live auditions. We love it, especially for comedy. You get that reaction, and I love it and want to maintain it. However, I have begrudgingly admitted that the new way of putting people on tape, let's, instead of me picking the five that I know are slam dunk to show Marta, I can see 55 in my office, tape them all, and find the five to show to Marta. Not Marta specifically, because we do ours live, <laughs> but on other shows. Yeah. It's tricky. It is. And also it's different, because again, it's LA versus New York. So I go to tons of theater, comedy shows, like improv and stuff. And, um, and I am also, all I do is watch movies and TV. So, I mean, it, it depends on how much of your life you want to give to your job. And like, Tracy has like a family and you know, and Wendy, I don't know your situation, but um, <laughs> I, I have no life, so this is my life. And so that's why I have an unusual roster of people in my brain that, um, you know, just comes with just, you know, it's, it's, Casting is an obsession to me, you know? It's like, that's why I do it, because I, I'm obsessed with it. I'm obsessed with, obsessed with actors. I'm obsessed. I don't go on the street and, like, cast people. Because um, you were like, you know, how do you get, you know, you're doing that. I don't do that, but I definitely watch, you know, like, probably movies most peop normal people just don't even watch at all. I'm not even mad at our casting directors. Um, like, weird horror movies. And I've said this before. I, I love genre stuff, because I think you can find some amazing talent and like slasher films and horror films that are like these young people that they just, you know, there's no money for the budget so they have to cast unknowns. And then they, I've, I've come, I've, I've found so many cool kids just from watching these movies that nobody would watch, you know? And um, so that's what it is. I'm just kind of obsessed with actors and I just want to know who everybody is and so that I can, when, when Liz or, you know, asks me, have you heard of this person? Then I'll email back actually, and then like send like a whole like, I've auditioned them 10 times and I this, you know, so that I just like to be like, as fat, you know, know as many as people as I can. It, it's also really interesting when you bring us people who we haven't heard of before, we've never seen before, um, exciting new people, they may not pay off in the moment, um, but sometimes a year or two later, I mean this, I, I credit Tracy with Matthew Perry, even though Tracy didn't, didn't cast Friends, She's the first person to bring Matthew Perry my way on Dream On. And after Dream On, when we started doing Friends, he was the first name on our list for Chandler, but he wasn't available. But that was Tracy. That, wasn't the, I mean, that was because Tracy brought him into Dream On, he was on our minds, and we said, we got to bring this guy in. So there is a, also a lasting effect that you all have on us. Totally. That, I think that's a big thing, too. Like, I remember that from Carly and I both, my co-creator Carly and I, we both come from theater. And so we've done a lot of, you know, when you're working on a play, you cast a reading, then you cast a workshop, and you're working with these actors for, like, potentially years on the same <laughs> play, just, like, trying to figure it out. And so you're in the room a lot doing that stuff and then you know somebody will come in and you it'll like ring in your head if the casting director says like oh this per this person is just give it like 2 years and then you do and that person is you know Chris Abbott or like <laughs> Adam Driver like it all it just happens cuz like they, they just see a thing and you remember that they saw a thing and i feel like that's also part of the you know that was also really helpful for us cuz we had we were looking at you know actors who we were going to train to become wrestlers for GLOW, and that, which is a huge leap of faith in and of itself to have somebody <laughs> sign up for that situation. But we were also looking at some wrestlers. Yes. And that was a whole new bag of people that we had never and for me, too. I'm yeah, not like, I mean, I watch a lot of stuff, but I'm yeah. not sitting there watching, like, no. women's wrestling or anything. And, uh, but I remember yeah. 
Kia Stevens. Well, Kia was the best. Was, yeah. She was. She's on our show, and she's, she's a wrestler. Flor- she's in Florida. <laughs> she's, she was in Florida, but I think she was in Japan at the time. She was when she take? Okay, so I had done. We had, so on the show, I had to do research. Yeah. Obviously, of, tons of wrestling there are, research female wrestlers these days they're not what glow was these are actually trained professional you know such um just fit women that do this and pound each other well that doesn't sound right but like uh, (laughs) but like are are really doing major major uh physical things that you most actors don't have the training for or anything you know so i saw we saw tons of real wrestlers and uh so kia stevens also known as awesome kong I mean, how could you not cast somebody? You're like, she put herself on tape in Japan first because she had some matches. Yeah. And then she lived in Florida, though. So we did scour sort of the country for the real, these real wet wrestling women. And yeah. Kia stood out among everybody. I mean, yeah. she was a really good actress, too. So You just said that thing, and I remember you sent it to us, and you're like, she has actor yeah. instincts. I was and just you like, watched the I was tape like, compared here. to everybody else. Yeah. She did, like, she had a different hold on it. She, like, she was finding things. She was attacking the material in a way that was totally different um, from the other wrestlers that we auditioned. So yeah. it was, I don't know, it was really interesting. And I think you, I also knew that Jen had looked at a hundred people. Like there was no way she, like, she might be showing us this one person, but she had seen it was a lot, a lot of, and people. it was painful. And a lot of them came in to read, um, yeah. with me. <laughs> so <laughs> as you guys know, sometimes non-actors can be a little challenging. <laughs> Um, but sometimes they, sometimes they're just green. Sometimes they, they work they out be great. Amazing. Yeah, exactly. Totally. It's, it's a hit or miss. So, um, so there was a lot of that going on. And it was also, I was casting in LA, which was a little, you know, I cast in LA a lot, but the show was shooting in LA. So I had to cast in LA. So I, I, I don't know if you find yeah. this, but I think one of the things that really helps, especially with actors who are non-actors, um, is that don't forget your casting director has to act with them. They have to sit there at every audition and read the lines. And if they don't, I know they say you should be able to act with a doorknob, but that's not true for everybody. Mm-hmm. And it really helps the actor when there's someone sitting across from them who isn't just saying words, but is giving, helping them find the sense of a scene. That's uh, uh, definitely true. And occasionally, maybe more than once, the. Uh, the problem, I shouldn't say, you've located a problem when Wendy's getting all the laughs. Yeah. Like, that's what yeah. happens, you know? You're like, that. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> you, that person's not measuring it. All right, well, I want to make sure that we've got some time for the audience questions now. So we're going to go out to you guys. Uh, we'll start right here. You were quick with your hand, ma'am. So go ahead. Hi. I really want to know how all of you feel about um, scripted web, web content, uh, well produced, not hard to watch, that actors make for themselves. Um, is that something you would ever actually have time to watch, you would enjoy? And if so, how would you go about finding it or like to be informed about the content? Well, um, uh, I had I had to join Twitter after Orange. I'm really not a social media person, but after Orange, there was such stuff going on, and so I joined that. And that really just following different people or actors or people will just send me stuff, like web series on there, and I, I would get to watch it. Um, I don't watch tons of web series, but I definitely go on YouTube a lot if I'm looking for something or if I'm like something unusual or just want to see what's out there. So, um, and sometimes I just see people that I didn't even know were. Um, like, like, like you, you, did you guys meet Cassie Davis yet? David yet out in LA? Okay, so she has this web series, right? And she's so cool and she's really interesting. And um, come to find out, she's like Larry David's daughter, but nobody knows that. So I watched it and I really liked her and I wanted to bring her in. And that's kind of, I was like a surprise, you know, it was a surprise that I was like, oh my God, that she had this funny web series, you know? So, so I don't know. I mean, I, I do try to look at it if I can, but it's hard if, between what, you know, working, auditioning people. And trying to see like the TV shows that are on too. So, so were you just were you, like, YouTube, kinda, I kind of do that sometimes, or just the internet in general. Like one, if you're searching for somebody, some it'll lead to something else. Sometimes right. usually, click and always, click and click. yeah, Rabbit yeah. You're just like, and then you get to this point, you're like, oh my, how did I even get there? Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of weird, but yeah. But but I'll tell you, I'm of two minds, um, and one, the good side is I, it's fantastic. There's so much content. It is fantastic that actors can make their own stuff and and put it out there and get it seen and all of that opportunity for everyone. Fantastic. But I have. 
been surprised, I'll say, um, when, and a lot of writers know a lot of this stuff and say to me, you know, let's see so-and-so, they're hilarious. And then when they come in, it's not always the same thing. It, stuff you've created for yourself and who knows how it was edited and who knows, and it's quirky and funny on, is not exactly the same as a, understanding an audition for a show that's on the air or a sitcom for that genre or it, it, it it doesn't always really work, which surprises me. Because I've been fooled, tricked, many, many times recently. I, I, I have to agree with Tracy with the downside. Because what happens is when someone presents you with what is in essence a vanity piece, you don't really get a sense of who the person is as an actor. Um, them doing your words is a very, very different thing than them doing what they know they do really, really well. It's fascinating and it can bring your attention to someone, but it's not always helpful. And then we just have the job of auditioning them to, to know that, and we try to keep it away from our showrunners. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> so we figured it out. It's like I wouldn't bring somebody on a series straight into a director session or a show, you know, like a, a producer session. You have to pre-read them, so. You know, being wildly creative and being able to put that out there in some way is not the same as being a good actor. All right, I think we've got some more questions. We'll go front row right here. Um, if you're just starting out and you want to get into casting, um, what kind of path would you suggest taking? And do you think that there's more opportunity when you're starting out in New York or LA? Like more opportunity in LA, for sure. Just more jobs. Yeah, there's, yeah. More, there's just things, more projects are in LA. So happy to hear somebody even wants yes. to be a casting director. Tracy can speak to this, <laughs> yes. <so. laughs> um, it's a long, I would, I mean, the Casting Society will take your resume. Uh, uh, there are specific things you can do. The Casting Society is, is putting together a program. Do you know about it? You're nodding like you do. A training program, which is going to be awesome, um, so that you can actually learn the stuff you need to know. But let me tell you, people, this past pilot season, were turning down pilots because there wasn't enough support staff. We need you desperately. So I'll tell you more specifically yeah, after. Yeah, it's a really weird road. Like for everybody, it's 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 been different, and you have to. It's, I mean, like it's an apprenticeship. Like I said, I interned first for like two years in college, so that when I graduated, I could be an assistant and start making money because I couldn't just intern forever. But that's what I can't hire somebody who has never done it before because then it just it's too much teaching when we have TV shows going that are so fast. So this training program that CSA is doing is amazing because at least they'll know the basics. I just need somebody to know the basics, that's it, you know? And then you work your way up. I mean, I, I was with uh, Ellen Lewis for eight years, you know, being an assistant and an associate. There's no, you know, there's, there's no college for casting. You just have to just commit to it. There are more, or more and more programs and we're trying to influence them because we find that college programs don't quite get the real world of casting. Um, so we're trying to work in cahoots with them and, and get this program rolling. Yeah. All right, um, right here, ma'am. Yep, you. Uh, hi, uh, I am a local Austin actor. I have also worked as an intern and an assistant for different casting directors in town, so I very, very much appreciate the work that you all do. Um, but being a local actor who's not in LA or in New York, I wanna know, do you ever consider people who are not in LA and New York? Their video auditions, and if so, mm -hmm. how, do, how do we get our agents to get us known by? I mean, definitely do. I think a lot of times it's a financial constraint, whether or not we can bring people in, fly people in. Um, some people are willing to be local hires, which uh, opens up, makes it much easier for us to hire somebody from out of town. Um, but that's usually one of the biggest obstacles. Yeah, is that, yeah, that we, but, uh, but the, the great thing about video, I mean, I know I hate a lot of the advancement in technology, but one of the good things is, you know, somebody in Texas or in Florida or in Japan can make a tape for us and we can get it in two seconds as opposed to like a tape that you had to FedEx and takes two days. I mean, that's what it used to be like. So, um, and in terms of your agents getting in touch with us, I mean, if it's, I mean, if it's a legit agency, they'll know the casting directors in LA and New York and they usually just email us. And I, all the time I'm just like, yeah, put them on tape for us. I'd love to see it. Um, and the you know. fact that no one, again, for me anyways, no one is usually in the session, so they don't know right. where you're recording from. If it's a hotel room in New York where you're shooting, my wall, 
Mike's wall. Like, nobody knows where... They don't know. It's very even. Yeah, it levels the playing field. Um, yeah. yeah, slate when they're watching. So yeah. it's, it's a great time to be able to be out of town. All right. Uh, sir, yeah, you've been ready. Thank you. Well, <laughs> um, other than, um, as far as non-traditional actors, other than going to plays and things, uh, you know, uh, for example, you have, you have Mark Marin on your show. Mm -hmm. How do you, what are you looking for? Do you do uh, <clears throat> comics, improv? Um, how, how did you choose it? <laughs> I've, I'm like, ooh. Um, no, Mark, I've known since I was about 22 years old because he was like the hot comic in New York when I was when I was just starting out. He was just like the like hot like hot guy and also hot comic. So he would like he was like ICM or something. He would, like, uh, he would love this conversation. Would, oh, he like, he knows it all. He, we're friends, so he knows it all. But he would like swoop in like if you could get him into read even. And, uh, and this is going back to like the, the early the, the 90s and. I just early wanted 2000s. noted by the way that I was a comic in New York at this time, and she has no <laughs> no memory, I, no reaction. To, go, go ahead, go ahead. But I was a little I was a little casting assistant who had like a talent crush on this guy. He was so funny, and he would like come in, and he wouldn't even look at me. Like it was that kind of thing where I was like, oh. um, and then uh, over the years that kind of lessened, and he had that. Well, he had that whole thing with the Air America. Remember, there was a whole thing where so he was sort of blacklisted a little bit um, for a while, and then he slowly was coming back with stuff, and I started casting him, and I cast him in Sleepwalk with me, I cast him in Girls. I, I'm the one only one to cast him in stuff before his show, before his show on IFC. And as soon as I read this script, I was like, this is, this is Mark. I mean, this is like his, this is wheelhouse, this is what he's great at, and uh, he feels like the 80s. It's like, he just had everything. And I was in New York, but I made him put himself on tape ASAP as soon as I got it. And it's, he's the only person I showed to them because I'm like, I can't do any better than this. <laughs> and it was like it one was, of the best auditions. It was crazy. It was, and we were, and we were also in the throat. Like we were mulling over people and we were being like so crazy. <laughs> and then she sent us, we were like, Mark Marin, all right. <laughs> and we watched it and we're like, oh shit, <laughs> it's him. Like, it's right. <laughs> We have to cast him off the tape, and we've made Alison Brie come into audition four times in person, and we're just gonna give Mark this part off of the tape. And we did. And we and, did. And apparently, and I haven't seen it. He's, he's amazing. I mean, I just knew the script when I was reading the scripts, and I was thinking about him doing these. I'm like, oh my god, everybody's gonna love him after this, like yeah. the way I did when I was 22. You know, he was, he's real uh, good. He's, he's really in it. He's surrounded by so many women. Yeah. He just doesn't know how to deal, it's which is also really fun to watch him navigate, like, <laughs> like just surrounded by ladies. <laughs> it's like a total joy. Yeah. So, so that's, how, that's how that happened. It was a 22-year-old casting assistant's talent crush. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think we have time for one more uh, right here. Why not? <laughs> and are you naming like the bigger agencies specifically? What, what or, or are you just naming agencies you know? I work with like a lot of assistants at CA and stuff like that, and so like I'm always kind of interested to see like the other side, like how you guys work with them. Like, how do you work with them? But but my question is, do you mean those agencies specifically? Because that's a different relationship than with some others. Um, yeah. I mean I, I try to just treat them all. I mean, like it's it's hard to treat them all the same, but I've gotten to they the point. They don't treat us the same. Right, but I've gotten to the point where I don't care, <laughs> honestly, because they, it's gotten so out of hand sometimes. Where they they'll it's like what you were saying before, Tracy. They'll they'll like agent their actors out of careers. So. Which I have to say, not only affects the casting directors, but it affects the showrunners. There are some agencies that behave so poorly that when I see that agency next to an actor's name, it is an automatic strike against the actor. Um, because, it's true. I don't wanna get into, if we're gonna hire someone, here you know what the money is, you know what this is, don't say yes, and then turn around and tell me you want twice as much money, and I was careful. You're going to then say it's twice as much money and back me into a corner and have me, you know, and, and this can happen time and time again. So it has a huge effect on the relationship that we have with these larger agencies where we also 
look for writers and direct, not just the actors, we're also, this is where we hire our writers from, and this is where we hire our directors from, and our other producers from, and it can have a hugely negative impact yeah. um, when exactly. they misbehave. Exactly, I think the, the actors probably don't, don't know. know. They don't know. Yeah. They don't. And, uh, I agree with Marta 100%. I have two agencies that are on my blacklist right now. Um, <laughs> But, but what she's saying, and this is important if you're just starting to seek representation, you, it's good to find out from other people in the industry whether the person that you want to sign with is well regarded. Because a lot of times we will just hear about the back and forth that doesn't go on in the room, about how they stymie the casting director about this deal, or how they're demanding in some way, and it really pisses us off, because we defend our casting people. And, and the actor may never know that the agent is really ruining their opportunity. Right. It gets beyond the acting, and it gets into, well, if they're gonna fuck with Wendy, I don't want them around, because they're family. It's like, <laughs> yeah, fuck it. I'm a son of anarchy. I'll get a motorcycle, I'll run over those. No. <laughs> But seriously, people don't really know, and so it's a good idea, even if you're new, just to make sure that whoever is going to represent you has a good reputation and people like them, because there are people that these people will not take their calls. Oh, they just I, won't deal with talk it. Talk about blacklisting. Yeah. Or, I, or I you know, if yeah. you, sorry, but yeah. I, I, if you have to hire somebody from you know where, and they're there, <laughs> They come in with kind of icky taste in our mouth about them, and they don't know, but you can't sort of help it when they've been uh, put out there as, you know, gre what we perceive to be greedy or unreasonable or all the crap that went into making the deal. Yeah, or just know. plain, as, as you just said, just treating Tracy poorly. Just why are you yelling at Tracy? This is the deal. Can't, don't yell at her. It's not her fault this is the budget we have. <laughs> Well, yeah. really quickly, uh, we actually got to get out of here, but I, I got to ask, just is there a quick tip or anything that you have for those actors so they can find out if their agency is well regarded? Like, how do you, how do you go about that? When they don't work anymore. So, okay. What I would do, I'm not an actor, but what I would do is I would find out who their clients are, which IMDb Pro or IMDb, you could find out who the client, and just see if you have any connection or know anyone who knows them, and just ask the other actors they're with, at least, especially if you're in Austin, that might be the easiest way, because you may not know the industry players, you may not be able to call Marta and say, hey, do you like Jack so-and-so, but there might be a connection to someone that they represent already, or you may just know. But don't ask the super someone. famous ones, because they get a whole yeah, different the experience. the super famous ones don't even know the names of their own agents. Yeah. But <laughs> like the real actors will actually know and I think that would that would help you because I'll get, and also when you go into the first audition there's an assistant the assistants in the casting agent and totally. we haven't really talked about this that's it they know what's going on and they know whose call oh, yeah. irritates yeah. the boss and who they're on, <laughs> they're on the phone when this person is going off yeah. at the casting director. So that may be another person to strike a friendship with and have a relationship with. You know when I you were an no, assistant. Oh, I feel like yeah. that's so, the yeah. casting assistants, I feel like I have so many friends who are actors. My sister's an actor. And I feel like a casting assistant who will one day become a casting director is such a key in to like what's actually going down. Because I remember all the agents who were mean to me when I was a casting assistant. Yeah. Every <laughs> single one. And me sometimes too. I'm just not available. Sorry. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you guys so much for coming out thank today. You. Thanks to everybody who came in. Good luck at the fest. <laughs>